Now, let me introduce you to Jan Petrasik, qualified as a physician from Charles University in Prague and holds a Master of Science with distinction in quality and safety in healthcare from Imperial College London. Jan has 20 years of experience in all areas of pharmacovigilance, being former head of risk management section at the European Medicines Agency, head of pharmacovigilance in the Czech Republic, head of strategy and development of the Czech National Authority, and member of CHMP Pharmacovigilance Working Party. He participated in development of several national European ICH and SIOMS guidelines. He was the lead author of the EMA guideline on safety and efficacy follow-up risk management of advanced therapy medicinal product, and member of the ICH E2F expert working group on development safety update reports. Jan is a very active trainer in international courses, as in an, is an elected member of the advisory board International Society of Pharmacovigilance. He also works as a European Union qualified person responsible for pharmacovigilance for major innovative companies, perform complex audits, strategy consultancy, and led fast growing organization as entrepreneur and CEO for the last 10 years. Dr. Jean will present his conference entitled Clever Medication Process Design with Building Risk Management. We invite you to actively participate during this presentation. If you have any questions, please ask them in the chat on the left. We'll be responding to as many as we can during the allotted time. The rest of the questions will be answered and published in our Q&A section within Patient Safety Day on our webpage, isoponline.org. Without further preamble, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Jan. Thank you so much, Melissa, and thank you, my dear colleagues from ISO for organizing this great event and for inviting me to be part of this event. Uh, so I, I'd like to share with you a point of view that may be useful for both healthcare professionals and patients around a very modern approach to the risk management of medicinal products and prevention of all the risks and harms that might be associated with the use of the medicinal products. Um, you know, uh, regulators and uh, uh, those who are developing the medicinal products should really have a very open-minded at the beginning when they are you know, considering what kind of products to develop for what conditions and uh, how to present information that we collect during the clinical development and in post authorization phase to the healthcare community and to patients so they perfectly understand in what situations the products has a positive benefit risk ratio and uh, uh, when uh, those situations may occur that uh, may present risks. Uh, I think many people forget that actually what is a favorable and unfavorable effect is a just a uh, matter of judgment of a, of a human beings. It's arbitrary judgment and it's not set in stone. <clears throat> and we have seen in a couple of development programs where actually the unfavorable effects have been marked as favorable and vice versa during the development because simply it's, uh, it was better for the explanation for the positioning of the medicinal product in the market. I think the most common example, most known example to everybody is Sildenafil Viagra and during the development program actually the original unfavorable effect was actually <clears throat> marked as favorable and marked as the main indication uh, whereas the original indication, the vasodilatation, the uh, blood pressure drug basically uh, was uh, all of those effects were marked as unfavorable. Uh, does it mean that actually those effects disappeared? Of course not. They are just marked as unfavorable, but they are still there. Uh, so f to be able to actually, you know, present the story in a consistent way around any medicinal product, we need to bear in mind that this is really just our subjective, sometimes more objective <laughs> judgment. Uh, and we need to be very open-minded when we are creating these stories. We also should know that um, the number of those effects vary a lot. So 
we may have one to perhaps three favorable effects that we select during the development program of any medicinal products. But there are dozens and sometimes hundreds of other effects that they are marked as unfavorable. And uh, obviously, as we accumulate knowledge about the medicinal product, <clears throat> we know more and more. So originally, we know dozens of them, then hundreds of them. But eventually, we may have you know, even a thousand of different effects. Um, and we simply do not know them at the beginning. So that's why we, one of the reasons why we have created the pharmacovigilance system to learn quickly about the other uh, effects, of other adverse drug reactions, especially uh, during the uh, usual use, typical use of a medicinal product in clinical practice. We have created the whole terminology around it and um, just let me just briefly summarize the terminology to you so it's not confusing for you when you are reading uh, various official documents like package inserts or as a summary of product characteristics or USPIs or other reference documents that is using this terminology. And also the national pharmacovigilance systems when they are asking you to report a certain type of information either to regulatory authorities or to pharmaceutical company. So the most broadest picture is adverse events. Uh, that's the biggest <clears throat> kind of uh, very general term, basically summarizing anything bad that can happen to a patient or to the subject of a <clears throat> clinical trial. Uh, and we simply do not know at all whether that was linked or not linked, related or not related with a medicinal product or with the exposure to the medicinal product. But yet we record it because in, you know, cumulative way, in aggregate fashion, when we assess that information, we may actually decide that some of those adverse events might be marked as a suspected adverse reactions. Suspected means that we have some reasonable suspicion, right, that there is a uh, relationship between an exposure of, to a medicinal product and a certain uh, adverse effect, uh, but we are still not sure. Only a subset of those uh, suspected adverse reactions are the true adverse reactions. So those are those that they are actually proven to have a causal relationship with the exposure to the medicinal product. And those are usually labeled. Uh, various um, countries have a different approach in terms of where is the threshold, how much information to share with the patients and with the healthcare professionals. So some countries label only this small part, some others a bigger part, and some others even large part of the adverse events with the commentary that uh, actually the relationship has not been established. <clears throat> so it, it, it really is linked with the culture of that country, it's linked also also with the healthcare profession um, and with the, the healthcare system and uh, with the legal system that is applicable in that particular country. Uh, those of us who work in pharmacovigilance, we also use other terms like in here, expected means basically a, a, it is already known, it is described in a, in a label. Listed means that it is known at the global level, but in some countries or some regions, it has not been yet um, uh, listed um, or you know included in the local reference safety information uh, so you might have a situation where something you don't something you you uh, experience after they being treated by the health by the medicinal product you don't find in the package insert in the in your particular country uh, then of course you are supposed to uh, share that information through reporting or through other means and uh, you know, in that particular country, it may be marked as unexpected, but uh, actually in the global, at the global level, the company may say uh, it is already known, uh, it is in our core data sheet, the global data sheet, and uh, we mark it as listed. So that's perfectly possible. <clears throat> and there is a term of serious adverse event or serious adverse reaction uh, that is actually legally defined and pretty well harmonized globally what is serious and it is uh, defined by the outcome of that reaction usually when the uh, adverse re event or adverse reaction leads to uh, death or is life-threatening or congenital anomaly or incapacity incapability um, 
you know, the, or it's, it's simply medically important, uh, then it may be marked as a serious and uh, that means that there is a higher priority for the uh, processing of that information. Severe is intensity. So you may have mild, moderate, severe, or you know, intensity of one to five in certain situations, depending on the scale that is applicable, uh, typically used in clinical trials or post-authorization studies. And it gives you kind of qualitative information about the intensity of that reaction. And the reportability varies so much between the countries. Every country has its own rules. Some regions have harmonized those rules, but many others have not. And uh, that means that some of the agencies might know uh, certain information sooner or later, or they may exchange that information sooner or later, or not at all. So uh, that's uh, that may explain a different recommendations that you are getting from various regulatory agencies and different decisions as well. That is being harmonized, but it's still, uh, there is still a lot of work to be done. Then for the risk management, um, the, the, the regulators um, have agreed with the industry that actually uh, we should not work with the terms like a benefit and risks because they are very hard to define and, and tackle. It's much easier for many of the benefit risk assessment methodologies that we are using to work with the favorable and unfavorable effects. And for unfavorable effects, that's where the traditional pharmacovigilance approach is. Uh, we work with the risks. Those are, that are, um, those are the situations that have been proven to be associated with, uh, causally associated with the exposure to the medicinal product. We, we work with the adverse drug reactions, which are similar to the risks, but might have a little less of the certainty. And as we go to the right in this table, we have higher and higher uncertainty. So we have unfavorable effects with certain level of, uh, you know, certainty that there is causal association. Then we have a, a uncertainty around those unfavorable effects. We simply do not know whether they are really caused by the medicinal product or whether they are caused by something else. <clears throat> so there are potential risks, there are pharmacovigilance signals, um, there are adverse events. Uh, but we work in pharmacovigilance with these situations already. And obviously we are even planning for learning more about those situations in a post-authorization phase so that we can quickly inform uh, users of the medicinal products, healthcare professionals and patients, uh, that some of those potential risk signals or adverse events actually uh, have been proven to, to, to have at least a reasonable level of causal relationship. And then it goes to this level and it's becoming uh, labeled and it may be also communicated through dear healthcare professional letters, websites, through Q and A's, uh, there might be educational program or updated communication of that kind uh, so that we ensure that uh, the, the users know uh, as much as possible before they can make decision and hopefully informed decision about how to use the medicine product. We have a concept of missing information as well. That means that um, actually we acknowledge that we have some gaps in our knowledge about the medicinal product. And that gaps may be linked to both uncertainty around unfavorable effects as well as uncertainty around the favorable effects. So we simply do not know whether the product will work in certain situation, in certain population, in certain indication. Um, and uh, we do not know whether uh, the people will be harmed or not um, in those situations. It's a very important category and uh, you can find actually much more about missing information in the published part of the risk management um, uh, plans, especially summaries of risk management plans than ever before. I'll show you where you can find it. Then we have a concept of lack of efficacy that we work with in the uh, in pharmacovigilance space that's around the uncertainty of favorable effects. We don't know why certain people do not benefit from the product. Uh, we have off-label use. <clears throat> off-label means that it has not been approved in that certain indication. There might be 
typically two reasons why it has not been approved. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, there is not enough evidence <laughs> to support that particular indication. The second is that there is a legal obstacle. Uh, so perhaps uh, that particular indication is protected somehow from through the legal means and therefore a certain company cannot get it labeled. Uh, so there are various various reasons for off-label and uh, nevertheless we need to be aware of those situations uh, and uh, of course be aware whether actually off-label use presents a risk or not uh, to the users of medicinal products and if there is some risk obviously that risk needs to be communicated as well through uh, the, the same means as, as other effects. And then we have indications which are proven favorable effects of a medicinal product. So on the left, you can see the expected effects. Typically, this part is, is being labeled. This part is not in the label, but you can find a lot of information about this part in a document that is called risk management plan. Uh, the, benef uh, the, the risk management plan actually today includes quite often both parts of the coin, the, both sides of the coin. So it's not only about the safety, it's also about the benefit. So uh, you can find there the safety specification with the summaries of the safety concerns, the identified risk, the potential risk, the missing information. What the company is going to do in terms of further studying those safety concerns and what the company or even a, what the government of certain uh, countries uh, is going to do around the risk minimization. So what are the interventions to mitigate those risks that might be associated to the medicinal product? A similar approach may be applied to efficacy. So you can identify important uncertainties around the favorable effects. You can find out further information to decrease those uncertainties. And of course, you can plan your interventions to optimize the benefit uh, of the medicinal products for the patients. <clears throat> what is quite important is that actually this goes beyond just the favorable and unfavorable effects of a medicinal product. It is very much about the behavior of the users of the medicinal products. It goes very much to the patient safety discipline, to medication errors, to the interactions, to uh, you know many other aspects that affect uh, the, uh, the the true benefit risk profile for medicinal product. Here is a good example. Kimria is uh, one of the very advanced therapies. It's CAR T cells, so autologous CAR T cells. <clears throat> and uh, obviously that uh, advanced therapy is associated with uh, many risks and many uh, safety concerns. So this is public information. You can find this on the website of regulatory agencies. And this is just a list of the safety concerns can see it's really to the point what really matters. It's not uh, dozens of pages of SPC or package insert. This is a very quick summary uh, of what are the safety concerns. And you can also find what is the evidence behind those safety concerns and what the company and the government are going to do about it. So I think it's a very powerful tool, and especially in the context of high-risk medicines, in the context of uh, advanced therapies, context of oncology treatments, and, certain, uh, and similar situations like that, it is very powerful and very transparent uh, way how to get information about the medicinal products. Uh, <clears throat> so. The risk management approach goes beyond the favorable and unfavorable effects. That's just the first uh, bullet point in here. In fact, uh, it works with all of these concepts and perhaps uh, sometimes even more than these concepts. So, you know, the selection of the right patient is the right diagnosis, right? It's, it's one of the main aspects of or preconditions that the patient will benefit from the medicinal product. It sounds easy and straightforward, but quite often it is not. And uh, quite often the right diagnosis is not done on time uh, or properly. Uh, so therefore the patients do not benefit as they could. Uh, sometimes it's also because of the very unclear communication about what the right indication actually is. Because uh, obviously 
there are some marketing pressures in some especially in some countries or regions where actually broader indication or very unclear indication allows for uh, broader use of the medicinal products and um, while this may be uh, from the short-sighted perspective a good for the profits obviously it's not good for the patients and healthcare systems uh, so be aware of that i'm sure you you are aware that may happen and uh, double check what is really the right indication for the medicinal product and whether the patient um, in front of you or if you are a patient whether you are really the one who should be getting that particular medicine the right dose and route of administration the dosing surprisingly varies between countries and regions very much even based on the same evidence um, so um, <clears throat> route of administration is uh, one of the major medication errors that we are seeing uh, with the fatal outcomes, right? So the wrong route of administration chosen um, may lead to fatal outcomes um, quite often. Uh, the overdose or underdose, uh, so in other, mean, in other words, not the right dose, obviously is quite harmful as well. Uh, so that is, that is another big aspect of the risk management. The quality, including the design. So I'm not talking about sub-quality only or you know, variations in quality, especially in biologics, uh, but also about the design of the medicinal product itself and uh, about the design of the medical devices um, that may be used for a delivery of the medicinal product. I think the, the most typical examples are inhalers. Um, there are so many bad inhalers on the market and still, you know, the patients do not like them. It doesn't work uh, as, as it is supposed to work. And uh, we see it's a part of the risk management as well. If the device that is supposed to deliver the right dose to the right place is not really functioning well, then obviously the likelihood that the people will benefit and not getting harm from the medicinal product is not very high. Uh, patient's compliance is a link with many of the factors that we just mentioned, uh, but it, there are plenty of studies in the drug utilization world uh, showing that actually patients are quite often not using the medicinal product as prescribed or the way they are supposed to use it. And uh, sometimes there are good reasons for it. Sometimes there are just, uh, you know, omissions, mistakes, errors. Uh, there are sometimes there are economic reasons for non-compliance with the treatment, um, uh, but it is a big factor for a true benefit risk profile for medicinal product. Because if patients are not using the medicinal product, uh, what's the likelihood they will benefit from it? Uh, <clears throat> so that is, or using it wrongly, then what's the likelihood that they are getting a harm from it? Quite high. Timely treatment adjustments or so clinical follow-ups. <clears throat> so there, there are many treatment regimes uh, that need to be adjusted. The dosing, the frequency, sometimes even a pharmaceutical dosage form. Um, and uh, it's linked with the last bullet point in here. What is the overall length of the treatment, especially for chronic diseases? So is it that clear uh, for how long the people should be treated? Right? So I think the typical the typical examples again uh, are around uh, the psychiatric in a psychiatric uh, area. So, for instance, a major depression. So for how long people should be getting the antidepressives like SSRIs? And uh, is there a very clear guidance about discontinuation of SSRIs? Right? And is that guidance being really followed? Uh, so those are very important aspects of the safety and of course benefit risk profile they are not always that uh, very well communicated um, uh, unfortunately so the companies have these traditional tools uh, for delivering the messages around uh, the medicinal products and don't take me wrong it's really the pharmaceutical companies who are creating that story around the medicinal product and communicating it to the healthcare professionals, and then healthcare professionals communicating it to 
patients quite often. In some countries, obviously, it is allowed to, for pharmaceutical companies to communicate directly with the patients, but in many companies, it is not allowed. Uh, sorry, many, many countries. Uh, so this is the typical uh, cascade of the information. So uh, in terms of the provision of the information to the healthcare professionals and patients, labeling educational materials, especially additional educational materials, uh, obviously many uh, forms of those educational materials. It's not only written form, traditional, well, <laughs> more, more and more often the web is actually the main um, communication tool. Uh, we use more and more uh, videos uh, or educational cards, cartoons, um, uh, the, those tools that actually may deliver the message much, much better than just uh, some black and white text. Um, <clears throat> and it is very important, the companies may also uh, provide face-to-face -face training and uh, they may also use uh, reminders. Uh, so like um, repeated letters or alert cards, checklists, some other IT alerting mechanisms. So that's one part the, of risk minimization interventions that the companies are using. The second part is around the distribution. Uh, so making sure that only those people who know how to use the medicinal product will actually get that medicinal product. Obviously the legal status like OTC or prescription only is the traditional one, but then you can also have in some regions a reservation for hospitals only or certain specialties only, or you may even run a control distribution system so that there are only centers of excellence who are accredited for using that certain medicinal product and uh, uh, they need to follow a certain process procedure uh, steps in the treatment regimes to make sure that the benefit risk of the profile uh, of that medicinal product is, uh, is maximized. So going deeper to that medication process and how all of this introduction that I just provided to you uh, is applied or can be applied in practice. And that's what I call this clever medication process design. So the usual medication process has four steps. Sometimes it is described in various uh, textbooks uh, in, in more granularity, but typically we have four steps, prescription, dispensing, administration, and then the patient follow up. So how can we ensure that the true prescriptions, there are no prescription errors, and actually the right patients are getting the right product? Obviously, clear indication clear information about what kind of pretreatment tests there should be and who is going to pay for those tests. Is it the, the part of the normal healthcare practice or is it something in addition? Um, so those pretreatment tests are very, very important, especially for uh, situations where the, we have already pharmacogenetic information um, and we know that certain people with certain phenotypes uh, certain genotypes will not benefit or they may even be in, at the increased risks. And there are, there are more and more sit, uh, uh, situations like that. Um, and fortunately, uh, these tests uh, are really introduced quite quickly and uh, diminishing the harm. So education of prescribers, who is, who is doing it? With what kind of bias? Is there a commercial bias or not? Um, and uh, whether the prescribers really know what they are doing, how to prescribe it correctly. Uh, obviously, in many, many countries, the clinical decision support systems are becoming a normal part of the practice. And I'm not talking only about the, the desktop computers that uh, the physicians may be using in hospitals and in their private practice. There are also many apps now available uh, some of those are officially approved and they basically are uh, regulated the same way as medical devices. Some of, uh, uh, some of those are just provided you know, for one or two purposes. Uh, many companies are actually deploying uh, apps to help physicians to uh, select the right patients for, the, uh, for, for that product, for the, for the treatment. 
uh, obviously the usability and um, uh, the added value that those apps uh, may provide varies enormously and there are literally hundreds of thousands of those apps now available uh, for all platforms. <clears throat> so uh, the companies should really have a mechanism to make sure that the information that is provided in those apps is actually in line with the story about the product that they have created and agreed with the regulators to present. So yeah, that is in the labeling, right? Uh, then obviously when there is a high risk product there can be a control distribution system that actually regulates who can prescribe and it regulates to whom you can dispense uh, that medicinal product. Um, there are typical errors uh, at this stage around drug names, so mix up names uh, in both prescription and dispensing. So typically sound alike, look alike names or even outer package designs. And obviously there are also preventative measures like electronic alerts now implemented very widely, especially around the rise, those contraindications, interactions and warnings. So for interactions, um, you know, the early systems were not followed very well because it's a, it provided alerts too often based on the theoretical interactions. And theoretical interactions were not clinically relevant. The modern systems for those alerts, they also provide a clinical relevance grading um, as a feedback. And obviously when you have a grading and the grade, the highest grade is uh, an interaction that is life-threatening, uh, almost none of the healthcare professionals is uh, ignoring that type of a warning uh, from the uh, interaction checker. Obviously there is also a question uh, how much information you have as a dispensing pharmacist or prescribing physician about the, the medicinal products that the patient is actually getting. And uh, for that, there, there are various systems to, to address it. Uh, in a couple of countries, we have kind of a central repositories of electronic prescriptions. There are also checkers. In others, uh, there are mechanisms that are at the level of the patient. So the patient can have a certain devices like cards, memory cards, or prescribing cards and, uh, and similar tools uh, to inform the healthcare professionals that they are actually getting other medicinal products. So we do not rely only on the memory of the patient who might simply forget that they are getting other medicinal products or other food supplements or you know even a, a other herb, traditional herbal medicinal products and, and similar that can interact in a very dangerous way. So then we have dispensing step. Of course, again, the look-alike, sound-like names uh, may uh, may cause a dispensation er errors. Overall text and design quite often not very well done or well done for one country but not that well done for another country. So obviously that is a big big opportunity for improvement for drug manufacturers um, and that does also influence the administration step. So what is actually the instruction of the other package what is instruction that is uh, inserted in that package. Uh, the pharmaceutical dosage form, clearly it is within the power of the pharmaceutical company to design it in a way that is actually palatable, not big enough, uh, no, no, sorry, not, not too big, uh, that is um, uh, as user-friendly as possible. Uh, <clears throat> and not always the case. And uh, it's really difficult to understand why. Um, is it because they have not in, you know, invested uh, sufficiently in the development of that pharmaceutical dosage form or is it just they don't care or is it the question of the costs or is it something else? Um, I can certainly be improved in many, many, many situations. Uh, and it affects the patient's compliance so much. Obviously the patients who uh, who are supposed to take some kind of a, even disgusting medicines sometimes, uh, will 
probably not comply the same way as those who are getting a medicine that is palatable or even pleasant. Uh, <clears throat> then the user-friendly medical devices, the pre-filled syringes, the bands, the inhalers, you know, devices that make it easy for patients uh, to take the medicinal product correctly. Um, and those devices may even you know, remind patients that they already taken the, 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 the dose that day or remind them that they are supposed to take the dose uh, and so on. So there are plenty of clever opportunities to improve that part of the medication process. And of course, education and training. Uh, so we mentioned that for the prescribers, for the pharmacists, but also for those who are supposed to administer the medicinal products. So with advanced therapies, obviously, that may be a healthcare professional. So there might need to be a complex training of the healthcare professionals. Uh, but in most of the situations, uh, the, the, the products are administered by patients themselves or their caregivers. And uh, they need to have at least some basic education and training about how to do it properly. And then there is a patient follow-up. And patient follow-up uh, is often neglected. Um, so uh, it is not only about the reminder systems that they might need to renew the prescription or go for the certain tests, uh, go for the follow-up visits. Uh, but it is so, uh, even more important is, is the patient monitoring. So like plasma level monitoring or INR monitoring for warfarin uh, uh, or similar types of the monitoring uh, of the interaction of the medicinal product with the patient. Um, it is quite often actually designed in a way that you have certain clinics for the follow-ups. You can even use it for your studies as a scientist or you know you, you might be involved as healthcare professionals in the post authorization safety studies or even registries disease registries or the drug registries where we are collecting information uh, about you know how much the patient is benefiting or whether the patient is getting some some kind of a harm or not uh, from the treatment uh, so that follow-up is also useful for learning more about the effects of the medicinal products. This part of the medication process is very much influenced by the behavior of the patients and behavior of the healthcare professionals. So it is actually linked with the human error theory. Uh, many of the medication errors are linked with uh, the psychology uh, of uh, factors or human factors. And for that, I think it's very useful to understand uh, some of the, uh, the basics around how the errors are happening. Uh, one of the most popular ones is this SRK theory from Asmussen's. Uh, it, it, he worked with uh, the three levels of the competence um, and also three levels where the people are making errors and uh, uh, various ways how to address those errors. Uh, the lowest level of competence is knowledge. Uh, so typically young physicians, young pharmacists entering the field, they have a lot of theoretical knowledge, but can they treat patients? Um, rather not, uh, they need to get some practice. So they enter their residency places, their initial work uh, places. They are starting to learn the rules. So how do we do the medicine in here, in this ward, in this clinic, in this hospital? What can you do, what you cannot do? What are the typical tests available, what are not av available, what are the drugs available, what, uh, what drugs are not available and so on. <clears throat> so those are the rules around how to apply the knowledge. The same is when you are learning to drive the car, right? You can learn, uh, you can read a book about how to drive a car, but can you drive a car after reading a book? Not so much. You need actually to drive the car and learn the rules around uh, driving the car. So how to, how to actually drive uh, in the traffic. And then uh, over time, you are developing the highest level of competence, which is at the levels of the skills. 
uh, which is largely subconscious, so automated. You already, you know, when you are driving car today, after five, 10 years of practice, you probably do not need to think that much about driving the car anymore. You can even take a hands-free call or something like that, and you are still driving quite safely. Uh, the same is with, uh, with the experienced physicians, with consultants. Uh, they have done a similar things thousands of times before. They have a very quick pattern recognition uh, already in subconscious way. Uh, and uh, they can actually, they, they do minimum errors in, in that aspect. The problem might emerge when actually during this process, you fix some error news behavior or <clears throat> something ha has changed. So typically in our world, when we are actually learning about the medicinal products in the post authorization phase, uh, we are learning at this level, right? We are accumulating new knowledge. So then the pharma company may uncover a new risk, new adverse drug reaction associated with the medicinal product. They communicate it back to the practice, to the healthcare professionals, but how they communicate? They send a letter, typically, to the healthcare professional letter. It provides a, a piece of new knowledge. But if that prescribing behavior is already fixed at this level, so it's almost subconscious, you, how do you think that the new piece of knowledge what chance it has to change something that is already fixed at this level? Very little chance. And actually the studies are showing the, the effectiveness of the regular professional letters is typically below 10%. Yeah. So if you really want to change something that is already fixed in here, you need to do much, much more as a pharma company or as a regulator than just providing a new piece of knowledge through letters or through new label. Yeah. So there needs to be a training, there needs to be a various uh, communication channels used, conferences, face-to-face, -face, all of that. Um, and the companies today are supposed to measure effectiveness of this safety communication, especially that that is, uh, that is actually regulated by risk minimization. So they need to measure whether actually people have been uh, reading, have been, have been getting that inf new piece of information, whether they have read it, whether they have uh, understood. Uh, and I say people, I mean both the healthcare professionals and the patients. Uh, whether they actually modify the behavior. So for instance, they stopped using a certain medicinal product in certain indication uh, or in certain uh, route of administration, for instance. Uh, those are the most typical uh, risk minimization measures, you know, counseling indications, adding contraindications, adding warnings, adding serious adverse reactions, or even changing uh, route of administration and dosing. So these are the typically four levels in which uh, we measure effectiveness of this risk minimization. And then the highest level is optimizing. So did it actually prevent the harm? Did we save someone? Did we, you know, uh, did we <laughs> achieve the improvement of the benefit risk profile for medicinal products? That's the highest level and usually that requires a longer um, study efforts. So just quick examples about, uh, again, this Kimria CAR T cell therapy, um, which is autologous. You can see that for these products, for advanced therapy medicinal products, which is you know cell therapy, gene therapy, tissue engineer products, there is usually quite a, a complex process around the treatment and with many risk factors that we need to address in that medication process. It's much more than just those four steps of prescribing, uh, dispensing, administration, and follow-up. There are uh, additional steps that are usually linked around the manufacturing of the autologous medicinal products. And for these uh, products, we really need a proper risk minimization program and proper communication. And uh, it's much more than you, what you can do through the uh, traditional ways. 
So uh, these educational programs are very helpful. They are regulated, they are to the point, a lot of graphics and repetitions, uh, knowledge tests and face-to-face -face, uh, sessions. Uh, so this is an example of for uh, the healthcare professionals. And this is the very same example for patients, for pediatric patients. Which is very simplified, the same picture that you have seen in the previous uh, uh, slide, uh, simplified for pediatric patients. Uh, very simple language, plain English, uh, with very simple graphics, with the hope that is now <laughs> represented in here by this little superhero. And uh, it is working very well. Uh, so that's uh, additional added value of the risk minimization approach that is increasing the likelihood that actually the product will be beneficial, will be used as expected and uh, will be beneficial for the patients. So just three take home messages from this session. <clears throat> um, don't forget that actually for your medicinal product of interest, either if you are a prescriber or a patient, you can check the website of regulatory agency or a pharmaceutical uh, company that is manufacturing uh, or introducing that product on the market for latest information on risk management. Vast majority of the products have a risk management plan in place. Um, in English, it is available quite often in other languages as well. Uh, and uh, you can find much more information about safety, especially about safety, but sometimes also about efficacy in the, risk, in the summaries of risk management plans, then you can find sometimes in a cryptic way in the other uh, communication documents like SMPC, USPI or package insert. If you are un <coughs> unhappy about any aspect of the use of your medicinal product, so for instance, experiencing adverse drug reactions, you shall raise your concern to the regulatory authority. You now have so many uh, channels how you can actually report <clears throat> your experience and it's a really easy. Uh, and the, both the agencies and the market authorization holders have legal obligations to actually follow up and process your information. So it's never lost. It always enters the global pharmacovision system. Um, and it's, in, in, it's a very, very important that you share that information as quickly as possible, because that increases the likelihood that, no, that uh, it will be processed on time and that other people will not suffer from those kinds of uh, errors or adverse reactions. And do not accept bad quality. If you don't like some aspects like an inhaler again, <clears throat> you should demand really a high level of quality and a high level of safety from your medicinal product. The industry is here to address it and the regulators are here to, um, to supervise that the industry is addressing it properly. So thank you very much for your attention. I wish you uh, all the best in your careers and uh, I hope this uh, uh, presentation was informative and that you will find it very helpful in uh, your own life. Thank you. Dr. Jen, thank you so much for this important information. We have some questions from our attendees. So our first question is, within the risk management plan, scenarios such as medication errors that are not necessarily associated with the active ingredient, but with other stage of the process are contemplated? Absolutely. There is a very detailed chapter, uh, which is confidential usually. It's a part of the safety specification where a risk of uh, uh, medication errors needs to be discussed and um, uh, in a systematic way. And when there is a conclusion, then the medication error is an important safety concern. There must be a risk minimization measure uh, introduced around that risk. So sometimes it goes as far as to redesign of the medicinal product, changing the name of the medicinal product, or providing additional education to the prescribers or patients. 
Uh, our second question is, in your presentation, you mentioned the use of educational material for pediatric patients. From your experience, what has been the response of children about it? I'm not aware of a formal study in that respect, but the informal feedback from the patient organizations was very positive. So they, they because this, this piece of information is regulated, we are not talking about promotional materials here. We talk about educational programs for pediatric patients that has been actually reviewed by the regulatory agencies and approved. And this material is usually to the point and helpful. Uh, our third question is, according with the last slide, take home messages, the patient should check the website of the regulatory agency or pharmaceutical company to review the information related to risk associated to a product. But sometimes that information can be hard to understand for a lot of people. Is there any other strategy for patients to access reliable but more easily understood information? Thank you for a great question. And uh, you're right, sometimes it is difficult. Uh, but what is, what is a legal requirement uh, for the summaries of risk management plans, which is a public document, the legal requirement is that it needs to be in a plain language, uh, not using a difficult uh, terms, difficult context, and it needs to be understandable, readable uh, to majority of the patient population. Uh, so it, it is very similar requirement that is applied to package insert in many countries. Uh, so the, both the package insert and the summaries of risk management plans should be really easy to read. Uh, if they are not, obviously the second option, and sometimes it's becoming the best option, is to uh, go to the patient organizations. So the patient organizations themselves quite often have a very useful, practical and to the point information for their members. Not all diseases have a patient organizations that is functioning that well, but uh, in, uh, typically in orphan disease space or in very serious disease space, chronic disease space, um, many professional patient organizations are doing a great job and I must say better job than many of the members of the industry or regulators. Thank you so much for your, questions, your answers. We have a lot of questions, but due to the schedule, the rest of the questions will be addressed at the web page. Thank you so much again, Dr. Jan, for your interesting presentation. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too.